Take a look at the function f of x equals x cubed and its first three derivatives. If we ignore the coefficients, you'll notice the nice pattern whereby each derivative reduces the power of the previous function by 1. So x cubed goes to x squared, x squared goes to x to the 1, and x to the 1 goes to the constant 1, which you can think of as x to the 0. But there are functions that lie between these basic polynomials, in a sense. The fractional powers of x. A familiar one is the square root of x, which can be written as x to the 1 half, a function that's sort of halfway between being a constant and a linear function. But there's many more besides, so the fractional powers of x serve to interpolate between the basic polynomials. So likewise, since these polynomials came about from taking derivatives, could there be a way to construct a kind of fractional derivative that interpolates the ordinary derivatives? Is it possible to take, say, a half derivative of x cubed, or sine of x, or e to the x? Does such a concept even make sense? Going off of our polynomial sequence, since taking a full derivative of a cubic function yields a quadratic, reducing the polynomial's degree from 3 to 2, a good guess might be that the half derivative of x cubed reduces the exponent by a half, yielding the function x to the 2.5. Okay, that was easy. So are we done? The half derivative of x cubed is x to the 2.5? Well, not so fast. Before we get too busy concocting definitions for a half derivative, we should make sure we understand what properties a half derivative should have. Otherwise, we're just inventing half derivatives willy-nilly without any way to discover the sensible ones. Whatever definition we come up with for a half derivative, the one basic thing it should do to be worthy of the name is achieve the same effect as a regular single derivative if we apply it twice in a row. That is, taking the half derivative of the half derivative of a function should be the same as just taking the ordinary single derivative of that function analogous to how multiplying the square root of a number by itself results in the original number. By that measure, simply reducing the exponent of a power function by one half can't really be a proper half derivative because applying it twice to x cubed will yield x squared, which is close to but not quite the derivative of x cubed because the actual derivative has a coefficient of 3. So apparently, the half derivative of x cubed must be something a bit more complicated. I mean, the exponent of 2.5 still sounds about right, but evidently we need to include some kind of coefficient. But what coefficient? It's actually a pretty tricky problem. You'd think it'd be something simple, like maybe the square root of the exponent. But that wouldn't quite work, because the exponent changes after applying the first half derivative. Go ahead and take a quick swing at this problem. It's actually quite a fun little exercise. Now, if you were like me when I first tried to solve this, you got nowhere. So maybe there's no hope? Maybe half derivatives just simply can't exist? Well, it wouldn't surprise me. It was a pretty weird idea to begin with. But yet, that picture of interpolating between polynomials was so suggestive that I don't want to give it up just yet. But where do we go from here? Ironically, it'll actually help if we first turn to something that seems harder fractional integrals. Let's see if we can define a half integral. You might wonder why we're trying to come up with a fractional integral when we fail to get a fractional derivative working. Aren't integrals harder than derivatives? Well, yes and no. Yes, integrals are often harder to compute, but they often relate more nicely to each other and are less picky about what functions you throw into them. For example, any continuous function can be integrated, but not every continuous function can be differentiated, like the Weierstrass function, which is a continuous function that has no derivative anywhere along it due to its fractal jaggedness. And if you happen to watch the previous video, you'll know that integrals are also compressible, meaning you can represent any repeated nesting of definite integrals as an expression involving only a single integral. The way to do this is captured in Cauchy's formula for repeated integration, which I covered in detail last video. For example, plugging in f of x equals 6x 
into the formula with n equal 2 and lower integration bound a equals 0, the formula produces t cubed, the second antiderivative of 6x, just with x renamed to t because x was being used as the integration variable. This formula will be our ticket to defining a half integral, or really any fractional order integral. Remember, it explains how to turn a nesting of n repeated integrals into a single integral expression, regardless of what n is. So the trick to defining a half integral from here is actually very simple. You just plug in n equal 1 half into the formula. The only snag is that, as it's currently written, it requires us to take the factorial of negative 1 half, which is something we can't do. Except we can, because there's a function, called the gamma function, that extends the factorial to non-integer inputs in a very nice way. And if we replace the factorial expression in the formula with its equivalent in terms of the gamma function, we gain the ability to plug in non-integers into the formula. For the case of n equal 1 half, gamma evaluates to, of all things, the square root of pi. So putting that in, here's our formula for the half integral of a function f of x. But is that really it, though? Seems kind of suspicious, if you ask me. Especially that square root of pi. What on earth is pi doing here? Luckily, we do have a test for whether this formula is sensible. Just like applying a half derivative twice should result in a regular single derivative, applying a half integral twice should result in a regular single integral. Let's test it on the function f of x equals 2x, whose regular single integral we know is x squared. And just to keep things simple, we'll use 0 as the lower integration limit in the formula. Plugging f of x equals 2x into the formula and computing it, we get 8 over 3 times the square root of pi times t to the 3 over 2. This is encouraging so far, since we got 3 over 2 as our power of t, which is halfway between the powers of t and t squared. But the real test will be if the weird pi coefficient washes away when we apply it a second time. Sure enough, if we replace t with x, plug it back into the half integral formula, and go through some nightmarish computations that I definitely did not get a computer to do, we get t squared. Exactly what we expected, aside from the variable name change. So this formula really seems to work. It really represents a meaningful half integral. But we're not limited to just half integrals, of course. Using the same trick, you can similarly derive a formula for a one-third integral, and show that applying it three successive times results in a single integral. More generally, the formula for a p-order integral, where p can be any positive real number, is written like this. And you can show that composing any p-order integral with a q-order integral is the same as having applied the p plus q-order integral. This formula is actually one of the most well-known ways to define a fractional integral and is known as the Riemann-Liouville fractional integral. To get a more visceral sense of what it does, take a look at the various fractional integrals of 2x as I vary the fractional order p between 0 and 1. See how it gradually transforms into the x-squared parabola? And going from p equal 1 to 2, you can see how it transforms into the graph of the cubic x cubed over 3. Returning to the original line 2x, here's what happens if I change the integration lower limit to a equals negative 1. You'll notice the integrals of 2x get a little more complicated because the altered lower limit changes the values of the integration constants. But our fractional integral is still able to interpolate between them all the same. Okay, pretty neat. We now have a way to find an integral with a fractional order. And the trick was to take an established formula for computing an integer number of repeated integrals and replace the integer-dependent factorial part of it with the gamma function, which can handle non-integer inputs. This suggests a possible way to define a fractional derivative. Since this formula computes the pth order integral of a function, and since derivatives can be thought of as inverse integrals, Perhaps we can define a fractional derivative by plugging in negative values for the order p, thus defining a half derivative as being a sort of negative half integral. Or heck, 
Since we have gamma to free us from the constraints of the regular factorial, could we compute a regular whole derivative as the negative first integral? Can we ironically use integrals to compute derivatives? Well, not quite. For one thing, although the gamma function extends the factorial to the real numbers, it doesn't actually extend it to all the real numbers. Gamma is actually undefined for non-positive integer inputs, so we wouldn't be able to plug in p equals negative 1 into gamma to compute a derivative using the fractional integral formula we have. But even for fractional negative orders, like p equals negative 1 half, for which gamma is defined, it turns out the integral expression becomes divergent, since an integral of the form x to the p minus 1 is divergent near x equals 0 for non-positive values of p. So our fractional integral formula really only works for strictly positive values of p. Alright, so it's not going to be quite that simple to define a fractional derivative. But there's still another way to approach this. We know from traditional integer order derivatives and integrals that they're supposed to be inverses of each other, and should work to totally, or partially, cancel each other out. For example, taking an integral and then two derivatives should give the same result as taking just one derivative, or vice versa, up to a polynomial difference. So maybe we can use this formula indirectly to compute a half derivative by, say, first having it compute a half integral, and then taking the ordinary whole derivative of that, basically using the fractional integral to get us some kind of fractional order, then using ordinary derivatives to sort of lower that order to where we actually want it. This sidesteps the shortcomings of the original fractional integral formula, since at no point are we actually plugging in a negative order into it. But we're still making use of a property we expect derivatives to have, that of cancelling out integrals. It may seem like a bit of a hack, but it turns out it really works. This method of computing a fractional derivative is actually well defined, and if we use it to compute the half derivative of, say, x squared, we get 8 over 3 times the square root of pi times t to the 3 over 2, which is the same as what we got when we computed the half integral of 2x. And if we follow this up with another half derivative, we get 2t, the regular whole derivative of t squared. So we seem to have found a legitimate way to take a half derivative, and using the same trick, we can generalize this to any fractional order. To take the fractional derivative of any order p, first take a fractional integral of order alpha, where you choose alpha so that the sum of p and alpha is an integer k. Then take k many ordinary derivatives to get the effective integral order down to negative p. This technique for computing a fractional derivative is called the riemann liouville fractional derivative. And for shorthand, we depict it like this, where p denotes the order of the derivative, and a is the lower bound of the fractional integral piece. If we then combine it with its fractional integral cousin, we get a unified derivative integral operator that works basically as a piecewise combination of the two, where plugging in a positive order uses the fractional derivative formula and plugging in a negative order uses the fractional integral formula. This combined operator is known as a differ integral, which is a terrible name that should never have been coined when the much, much better name derivagral was available. Anyway, let's play around a bit with this new toy. We've already mostly seen what happens to basic polynomials like t squared, so how about we see what this derivagral, I mean differ integral, does to the function sine of t. Here I'll take the lower integration limit a to be 0, and vary the fractional order from p equals 0 to 1. You can see it gradually morph into a cosine curve. Interestingly, even though it kind of looks like the sine wave is just simply sliding over to the left until it becomes a cosine wave, it's actually a bit more complicated than that. The intermediate curves aren't necessarily sine waves. For example, the half derivative is this curve, which isn't a sine wave because two of its peaks are at different heights. Okay, but now let's see what happens to another function, like e to the t. What do you think its fractional derivatives look like? 
Well, since the ordinary full derivative of e to the t is just a copy of itself, a good guess is that taking fractional derivatives will also just leave the original unchanged. But that's not what we actually see. Weirdly, there are some genuine intermediate curves we pass through between e to the t and its first derivative, and they don't even look like exponential functions. But it turns out this weirdness is mostly an artifact of our chosen lower integration bound in the fractional derivative formula. Right now it's zero, which is not actually a very natural choice for integrating an exponential. Even with ordinary integrals, if you integrate e to the x from zero to t, you don't get just e to the t, you get e to the t plus a constant. And this constant will persist as we take higher order integrals, causing more and more trouble along the way. So to make the integrals of e to the x behave more stably, we should pick the lower bound to be negative infinity. Then the integral of e to the x will truly be just a copy of itself, just with x renamed to t, and likewise for all the higher order integrals. And so similarly, if we change the lower bound of our fractional derivative formula to negative infinity, the weird intermediate functions return to being just copies of the original e to the t. This highlights an important difference between fractional derivatives and regular integer order derivatives. Integer derivatives are what we call local operators, meaning the value of an integer derivative at a point only depends on the local behavior of the function in a small neighborhood around that point. You can mess with a function and make it all kinds of whack, but as long as you don't change the function's behavior near the target point, its derivative remains unchanged at that point. By contrast, the value of a fractional derivative at a point can absolutely change, either by directly changing the behavior of the function before that point, or by changing the lower limit of the integral which you can think of as changing what portion of the function's domain is visible to the fractional derivative. For this reason, fractional derivatives are called non-local, or that they have memory, because they're affected by what the function did possibly far before the target point. In this way, fractional derivatives are a lot like integrals, which are also non-local since changing the function far away from one of its integration endpoints will affect the integral's value. Though what's weird, and kind of magical, is that even though fractional derivatives are non-local, they become local once their fractional order becomes an integer. And stranger still, composing two of these non-local operators together, such as two half derivatives, can result in a local operator, like a regular derivative. This raises the question of how exactly we can interpret fractional derivatives. I mean, since they're non-local and are influenced by the function's behavior far away from a given input point, they must represent something pretty different than the slope of a tangent line, which is all about measuring a function's local behavior near a point. So what, then? Much to my own surprise, nobody really seems to know. Despite ordinary derivatives and integrals having pretty straightforward geometric and physical meanings, it seems no one has come up with a truly satisfying general interpretation of the fractional operators, or at least not one that's widely accepted. That's not to say that there aren't applications of fractional derivatives that illustrate their meanings to some degree, but from what I can tell, I think it's safe to say there isn't a generally accepted simple interpretation of the fractional operators on par with those of ordinary derivatives and integrals. But be that as it may, Here's one kind of cool visualization for a fractional integral. Start with the graph of some function f of x. We know the area under the graph from, say, x equals 0 to x equals t represents the integral of f of x from 0 to t. The idea is then to interpret the formula for a fractional integral, like this one for a half integral, as transforming the shape of the area under this curve. One way to do that is to pull the 1 over gamma factor inside the integral and view the new integral you get as scaling the height of the graph at each point by some factor dependent on x and t, where that scale factor is given by this piece of the integrand, which I'll call mu t of x. However, this isn't a great visualization since we start to lose sense of what the shape of the original graph was making it hard to see how this transformed integral relates to f of x. But there is another option. 
instead of viewing mu t of x as scaling the height of the graph of f of x at each point, view it as stretching and squishing the graph horizontally, where the amount a piece of the graph is scaled depends on where it's located on the x-axis. If you imagine cutting up the original integration area into a bunch of little rectangles, you can view this transformation as rescaling the base of each rectangle by a certain amount based on the rectangle's location, but while leaving each rectangle's height unchanged. The amount each rectangle is horizontally scaled is given by the same mu t of x factor in the integrand, where x refers to the position of a given rectangle. Doing this to all of the mini rectangles produces a new area representing the value of the half integral of f at t. What's nice about this picture is you can still make out the original f of x curve on top of the new integration area. It's just been stretched and squished a bit, sort of like an accordion. To get a better idea of what's going on, let's see how the half integral changes as we vary the parameter t compared to the ordinary full integral. I'll also go and horizontally stretch the half integral graph a little so it's not too squashed and easier to see what's happening. Now although this visual is neat, and potentially useful too, I don't think it's the definitive way to interpret a half integral for two reasons. One, the defining feature of a half integral is that applying it twice in a row is the same as applying an ordinary single integral once. But our technique here doesn't seem to easily let us picture applying the half integral twice, leaving its central connection to ordinary integrals a bit unclear. And two, this type of visualization is not uniquely tied to fractional integrals. You can actually use it to visualize any kind of integral transform, such as a Laplace transform, so it doesn't uniquely illustrate what makes a fractional integral a fractional integral. So ultimately, the meaning behind fractional derivatives and integrals remains a mystery. I have no idea either, of course, and no authority to speak on it, but for whatever it's worth, my suspicion is that whatever fractional derivatives and integrals actually represent, they probably have less to do with traditional derivatives and integrals than we might first think. Trying too hard to interpret fractional calculus in terms of ordinary calculus is probably like insisting on interpreting the equation e to the pi i equals negative 1 in terms of repeated multiplication. No. Just as the exponential function subsumes the concept of repeated multiplication so completely that its connection to it almost seems like a cute byproduct instead of a defining feature, I suspect whatever the true reality behind fractional calculus is, it will similarly leave our traditional notions of derivatives and integrals in the dust. Alright, but there's one more thing I should mention about fractional derivatives that shouldn't be left out of a video like this. Remember how we developed the idea for a fractional derivative? We did it by taking a fractional integral and then applying ordinary derivatives to it. The idea was that derivatives and integrals are supposed to cancel each other out, so we hoped this concept would carry over to the fractional setting, and it did. But notice that we could have done this a little differently. Instead of taking a fractional integral and then taking ordinary derivatives, we could have done it in the opposite order by first taking however many regular derivatives we needed, and then ending by taking the appropriate fractional integral. It's the same thing, derivatives and fractional integrals partially canceling each other out to produce an effective fractional order derivative, but it turns out that this alternative definition doesn't always give the same results as the original. Weirdly, the sequence in which you apply your derivatives and integrals matters, and picking a different ordering can alter the results. This means there isn't just one single way to define a fractional derivative. This alternative way, where you take the derivatives first, then fractionally integrate, is called the Caputo fractional derivative. But it gets worse. It turns out there's a whole slew of different formulations for fractional derivatives, and there's no definitive version. The one I've showcased in this video, the riemann liouville derivative, is one of the more well-known ones, but it has some shortcomings that I didn't have time to mention here. Maybe in a future video, we'll go over more of this and why alternative definitions like Caputo's were devised. But for now, 
Hopefully you've come away with a sense of just how wonderful and wacky the world of fractional calculus is. And beyond just that, perhaps gained a deeper appreciation for the clever techniques mathematicians use to extend concepts to domains where they at first don't seem applicable, and the fascinating things that can result, a process that is very much a part of the spirit of modern math.